We have the resurrection service next Sunday, and then after that, <clears throat> we're going to be going to the park, and we're going to be going to get our grub on with some good fellowship, and uh, hopefully we'll see whoever can make it, can make it, and if you can't, you cannot, but if you want to, I can take pictures of the food that we're eating and send it to you so that at least you know what you're missing out on, so the next time, you know, hey, I got to make it over there because, not, because I want the food, because we have all kinds of talent in here when it comes to the food. We have all kinds of talent in here. We're talking about food you may have not even heard of. And I've been exposed to all of that. Um, so there's some, there's some chefs in here. And we, some, we have some bakers in here. And by golly, when we have something like this together, man, there's, it's like hometown buffet times 10. It, it is so much delicious food that's taking place. Not only the food, but the people that make it. It makes it more... Exciting because you get to have the fellowship with them and, and be able to, to talk during that time. So it's really good for us um, to have that fellowship with, with each other. You know, that's the most important part about the body is that it's important that we don't separate ourselves from the body, but that we're in, we stay in fellowship with the body. That's, that's why the scripture says, don't forsake the assembly of the saints. Um, because a phone call and, and a video and, and whatnot, it helps out. But when you're personally talking to somebody in front of you, then there's change that takes place. There's, there's back and forth talking and conversation. And you can see the person and, and their, their face and you can see everything about them. And you're able to have that conversation which, which builds a, a relationship within the body. And we're also going to be talking about the body this morning. But what I want to also talk about is the transformation. Transformation that takes place in our lives, uh, whether we like it or not. When we're, when we're serving God, there's always going to be transformation in our lives. Uh, the transformation depends on what we allow God to do in that. Because of the transformation that God wants to do in us, sometimes we want to stop him midway and saying, Lord, I can't take it any longer. Please stop on this transformation. I just want to go and, and take a time out. And, you know, when God's transforming us, there's a pruning that's taking place. There's a, a mentality uh, shifting that's taking place. The way that you talk, it, it begins to change, and everything changes about you. It's uncomfortable. It's never going to feel good all the time. Verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. I just ask, my God, that you let this word transform us, Lord. Transform our hearts, our mentalities, everything that's about us, Lord, that we thought we knew, Lord. That we lay all that down, Lord, at your feet this morning. And help us to acknowledge, Lord, your transformation and what it means to you so that we are able to apply it, Lord, to our hearts this morning. And Father, help us to take this in. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is what? Your reasonable service. It's a reasonable service because God has done so much for us. It's a reasonable service because God has done more than enough for us. So how much more in return should we be giving ourselves as a service to God? Presenting ourselves to God, serving Him, when we serve somebody, what happens in that? When we serve somebody, we're serving them our best. We're giving them our best. That means, have you ever seen a, a, a waiter at a, at a restaurant? And they're, they're waiting on you, and they, get, they give you all the, the drinks on time when they see it half full. They, they ask you how your food's doing. If it's warm, they go warm it up for you and this and that. Everything that you ask of them, they're doing it, and they're like that. And at the end, you're like, man, I want to give that, that person a, a tip because, man, they were on target. And then you have another service that you have a server that's serving your food, and they don't even check on you at all. Your, your, your soda's been drank all the way through the, the, the night that you were um, feasting. And you're wondering where your server went because they're lost. And when they come back with, to you and they ask you, how's the food going? And your food's almost gone. And, and you're fin almost finished with your dinner. 
your thoughts towards that server is like, man, what kind of service is this? Yeah, you work here. Yeah, you got the title. You're working for this and you're getting paid for this. But yeah, you're not even putting forth any effort into doing this. See, there's two types of services that we can give to God. There's a service of when we give it half-hearted or no service at all. And there's a full-on service, meaning that whatever God is needing, that we're stepping up and saying, Lord, I'm here to serve you. I'm here to give you my very best. I'm attentive to what you're, you're telling me, and I'm responsive in what you're telling me to do. That's what a great server is to God, because it's only in his right, because his son Jesus has given us salvation, that we return ourselves, because we used to serve the world wholeheartedly, right? Nothing used to stop us. Trust me, if you needed a fix, you would go find some money for that fix. You would go pawn something at the pawn shop that you know that you thought you were going to get out eventually, but you never got out. You would go pawn that important thing to the pawn shop so that you can go get something. But what about when it comes to God? When God says, come up to me and serve me in this area of your life, even though it may make you feel comfortable, when you come and serve me, but serve me wholeheartedly, knowing that I am in control. See, when we serve God wholeheartedly, that means we're stepping into it, no questions asked. I mean, we're going to have the doubts. We're going to have the, the, the heebie-jeebies. We're going to have the nervousness. That's all normal, though. This is the stuff that we have to learn how to get over. And the only time we're going to get over this is if, if we're giving God our full service. See, if we're only serving God half the time, then there's a lot of areas that God hasn't touched yet. God only has touched half of your life. The more you give God, the more He can do. The less you give God, you haven't fully reached the full potential of the work of God that, wants to be, that needs to be done in your life. You haven't reached the full potential of what God is calling us to do. In Romans 6.6, 6, it says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. No longer be slaves to sin. That means no longer be a servant to sin. We are now servants to God, to the king of righteousness. To the one that has given us life, the one that has given us hope, the one that has established our feet on solid ground, which is in his word. But sometimes when it comes to this, we don't realize how much we actually give out. Or I've given enough. Or I've done enough. In second, in chapter 2, Romans 12, it says, And do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will to God. My watch don't work, so sorry. We're in trouble. Do not be conformed to this world any longer. You were saved. You were redeemed. But be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. That means no longer thinking the same. No longer having the same thoughts. No longer having the same struggles. That you may prove that what is good and acceptable and a perfect will to God. In 2 Corinthians, you don't have to turn there. In 2 Corinthians 4.16 it says, Therefore we do not lose hearts. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed every day. That's why transformation feels so, so weird at times. Because the outer man, the inner, the, it, it's changing. That, that fleshly man is perishing away. And so therefore there's a pull. And have you ever seen the movie Venom? Where that, that, that gooey stuff that sticks to you and, 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 and he's just trying to take it off but he can't because it's stuck. That old man is trying to leave you because God is trying to renew you. See, God is trying to do something new in your life, but it's not always going to feel that great. It's not always going to feel something that, oh my gosh, I feel the love of God on me and it feels so fantastic. I don't know anybody that says that only when they're at the end of the transformation that is taking place in their life. But at the beginning and at the middle, no way. 
pull out the Kleenex because we're in for a ride. But even though our outward man is perishing, the inward man that's within us is being renewed day by day because Jesus is starting the rebuilding process in our lives. That means all the old things, all the old habits, all the old desires, the fleshly things are being renewed. That means they're being taken out and the word of God is being established in our lives. That means we're no longer thinking the same any longer. We're no longer being the same. We're thinking differently now. We're acting differently. Our service towards one another is, is totally just different. And we're looking at that person like, what's wrong with them? What's going on with them? Why are they acting so different? We think they're up to something, <laughs> right? We get suspicious of people. No, because maybe God's just doing something in their life. And something broke and they're just saying, you know what, Lord, you can have it all. See, our minds are now being conformed to the truth of God. They're, that's what's going on. They're being changed and transformed. And so when this happens, and sometimes in the confusion of maybe not even knowing, this is an important place we, we're, we're, we don't lose heart of what's taking place right now. Don't lose heart of what's taking place. Change is good. Change is good. Change is good. I mean, it's like wearing a, a fresh pair of clothes. You know, change is good. It's like taking off those clothes that you've been wearing for years and putting on something fresh, something clean. Because we, we used to smell. We used to stink. Our attitudes used to stink. But when we change, that's good. That means something is happening. Something is needed. When we surrender to God, we begin to think differently, act differently. And the one thing that, that when we give our lives to God, when we surrender to God, we begin to think and act differently. Now, this is something that God was put on my heart that, you know, I have to, I have to share because it's the truth. You know, we go to church and, and we're like, man, I don't want to go to church because, you know, the, pa the pastor preaches hell and brimstone. He tells me that I need to do this. He tells me that I need to do that. He tells me if I don't change, then this is going to happen. And he tells me this and he tells me that. Look, the pastor is not going to change you. It's the word of God that's supposed to transform you. The tr pastor is not supposed to threaten you. <laughs> hey, if you don't change, you can't, you're going to burn in hell. I guarantee that. He's not supposed to give you that promise. His responsibility is to preach the word, and the word of God is supposed to be transforming your life. Because some people don't want to go to church because, man, that means I have to change. No, that just means you desire a change, but you don't want to change. Some people want to go to church, but they don't want to go because they're scared of change. They're scared of what they're going to have to give up. But little do they know that God has given you a free will. God doesn't say, as soon as you surrender, you've got to give up all of these things. No, God's going to begin a work process in your life. And then slowly and surely, you're not going to have a desire any longer for any of these things that you know are no good for you. That's the power of God and His Word. In that verse where it says to be transformed, to be conformed, not to be conformed, but to be transformed, it refers to an invincible process that no one else can see that Christians, it takes place in a Christian's life that no one else can see. See, there's something that's invisible. There's something that no one else can see, but only you can feel. Not everyone will understand what it is that you're going through when the changes are taking place in your life. No one's going to understand why you're changing, why you're talking differently, and why you're dressing differently, and why you, uh, whatever differently. No one's going to understand that but you, because it's a process that no one else can see, but only you can see. Only you can feel. Only you know what's going on, because only you know what changes needed for your life. People won't understand you. People won't get you. I remember when I used to go to a church a long time ago that when it came to the guys, and this was years and years ago when, when I barely started going to church, these guys, um, their priority was to hang out together. Guys, not, guys day every, every other day. Every other day. And... My wife's like, well, what about, what about me? What about you? The guy, these guys are believers, man. 
And they're all doing it. They're all getting together. Some of them were married, and one of them or two of them were not. But I would always go and always go and hang out and always um, have fun. But then, every, but then I made a decision because I started being convicted that I was neglecting my wife. And I was always going over to my brother's homes to go have fun and, and fellowship and eat and, and play video games and so forth that I didn't know I was neglecting her. And she had mentioned to me once or twice, but I mean, that's all it was, but the conviction, the word began to convict me. And the day that I made my stand saying, I can't, I, I, I'm going to go home, I'm, I'm just going to stay home with my wife. They did not understand the concept to it. Because it was something that was changing in my life, knowing what things are more important in life. What things are going to go along the side with me in life. What things are going to maybe separate from me in life. And I'm, yeah, even in that, you know, I was made fun of. Oh, your, your wife has you whipped or whatever, whatever. I mean, they didn't understand what God was taking me through. They didn't understand that I was responsible for her well-being. I'm responsible for her overall. Yes, she, she walks out her own salvation and trust and in fear of, of, of the Lord. But my responsibility, my job was to protect and, and, and to, to cover and to be there for her. And some never got it until, I don't know if they ever got it. But how much do you want to be transformed? How much are we willing to change when it goes against the current? That's the hardest part. Man, when everyone else is staying the same, but man, you, you out of, out of one out of the 10, one out of the 20, all of a sudden you're feeling like, I can't do this any longer. It's irritating me now. This is not where I can stay at because, man, God is pulling me. God is pulling me to, to change. God is calling me to change. And now you're kind of looking around like, man, but who else is feeling this? Right. Have you ever felt alone doing that? Felt lonely? Almost felt like, you know, the odds were against you. But at the end, when you start coming out of this, you start feeling like, man, you could stand on top of the world. It happens. And it happens, it happens everywhere. It happens on our job sites. It happens in our homes. It happens in, in our relationships with God. Month, days, hours, as time goes on, we start feeling this more often because we start being more submitted to God. And as we stay submitted to God, we have more opportunities to experience these things. Verse 3, it says, For I say, though, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. According to the grace that God has given you, according to the grace given to you, given to me, how do we give it to others? How do we give it to others? Because some of us just received enough grace to get us past, us, past life. But some of us received a lot of grace because we had a huge past life. But in other words, and, and, but nonetheless, we all have a certain amount of grace that God has given us, not only during the time that we ask Jesus to come into our lives as our personal Lord and Savior, but time, as time went on, God has given us grace over time. But out of all that grace that God has shown us, how much of that grace that has been given to us have we been giving back to others? Or do we not have time now? Because God is doing a lot in your life. Do we not have time now because now it's, it's, it's busy and, and, and I can't get a conversation in? How much grace has God given you and how much grace are we giving to others? I want to continue to receive grace throughout my whole life. But if I can't learn to grace others, then how am I going to be able to receive grace myself? Because sooner or later, I'm going to have that Holy Spirit saying, hey, hello, you want forgiveness? 
You want grace, you want you want these things, but yet you can't give it. You can't give it to others when, when they're not even asking for it. You can't give it to others when 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 they're in need of it. And this isn't a very important subject when it comes when it talks about the grace. Because 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10, it says, According to the grace of God, which was given to me, as a master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed on how he builds. See, Paul understood that all the work could not be done alone. Paul could not do the work all by himself. So therefore, teaching and allowing others to build on that. In this grace, we teach on how to build and not leave them on their own ideas. That means when it comes to building a relationship with God, when it comes to establishing your faith in the Word, that it's not just left to the preaching and to the, and to the Instagram post and to the Facebook post. That means it comes to the one-on-one -on -one discipleship. That means it comes to the, hey, let's conversate, let's talk over the phone call. Bring me a scripture that you want to talk about so that you're able to be more established in the word you want to learn about leadership well let's talk about leadership you want to learn about ministry well let's talk about ministry you want to learn what God wants to do more in your life well let's talk about more of what God wants to do in your life why because Paul understood that he could not do it on his own so as leaders today, we got to understand as the body, the leaders themselves cannot do it alone if the people are not understanding what God is calling them out to do I could sit here in a church right now, and I could listen to the service, and I could be like, man, pastor, that was a good service right there. Man, I feel inspired. I, amen. All right, cool. I'm going to go back to work. I'm going to do my daily duties. But not to be able to grasp the concept of what God has purposed in your life. See, that's the most important thing of today. What has God purposed in your life? Have you been able to find that purpose? And acknowledging that, have you been able to dig into that purpose? Meaning, exposing it, dissecting it, what is needing for me to get to this very place in my life? What decisions am I having to do to get to this place in my life? The way that God has been speaking to me, how am I going to get there? And how am I going to make these decisions to make it to this place and what do I have to give so that I can make it to this place in my life this is where we should be not everyone will desire about desire that that's okay but I'm talking to the ones that are like you know what I want to take the next step I want to go up higher I want to understand God a little bit more not too much more, because sometimes when we want to think about knowing God to a different level, it kind of gets kind of scary because we don't know what to expect. Because obviously there will be change. There'll be change in us. There'll be change in you. We never can expect what God wants to do in our lives. And with that, he understood that, you know what? He couldn't do it alone. But even in that, as a body, we should be able to understand that you can't do it alone. Everyone that's in this, in this building, you can't do it alone. You're going to need to ask for help. You're going to need to ask for some type of, some, some questions. You're going to need to ask questions. Because if you don't ask questions, then that's just where you're going to stay at. You're going to play the guessing game and not even knowing, like, am I actually doing the right thing? Leave that accountability to your leadership. Because whatever they tell you, they're going to have to answer to later on when they come into the presence of God. Yeah. Well, remember when he told brothers so-and-so this and sisters so-and-so that? Yes, I, I remember that. Well, that was right. Good job. Thank you. Well, that was... Uh, Sorry, Lord, I was work in progress. I was trying to do my best. They're accountable for everything that they do and say. Not one thing will be forgotten. Who, who else wants to be a leader? 
Yeah. Who else wants to step up to that responsibility? All because on the outside, it looks easy. On the outside, I have a lot more brighter ideas than, than, than the leadership. On the outside, man, I, I can do better when it comes to preaching. I can do better when it comes to discipleship. Well, who wants to become a leader and handle all the accountability? Right. Who wants to be the one staying up at night? Because you are keeping them up. <laughs> because you're too busy trying to hide from God and you don't want to have a conversation with your leadership. So therefore, you're resisting and you're keeping us up. Stop holding back. I love my sleep, you know that. <laughs> and by golly, you know what? As a matter of fact, we haven't been sleeping well, so who's holding out? <laughs> who's not calling us and asking for some information, huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to lock these doors and, until we get a raise of hand. So, hey, I haven't been calling, Pastor. I haven't been calling. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, you're going to stay here now until we finish our conversation then. <laughs> Keep me up. I think I'm going to reverse it. Lord, whoever's keeping me up, Lord, and they're, not, they're just holding out, Lord, keep them up. Let me get my rest. Reverse, reverse, how do you say a uh, reverse uno, or what is it called? Yeah, reverse psychology. Reverse uno, yeah. I don't play uno. Verse six. Having the gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Verse 8, it's talking about exhortation. Whoever exhorts with exhortation, referring to encouraging people to live as Jesus according to the gospel. This is what it's talking about. An exhortation, referring to encouraging people to live as Jesus taught according to the gospel. It's talking about somebody who leads. In King James Version, it talks about ruleth. To be over somebody to do it with, to preside in a position of authority in a meeting or gathering. So that means it's their responsibility to, to encourage people to live as Jesus taught according to the gospel. Paul stresses that those that are gifted with leadership are called to preside over people with eager and diligence. That means nonstop. That means nonstop. To see growth take place. To see you to begin to grow. And if you're holding out, that means you're going to continue to get bugged. That means if, if, if you know that you're supposed to be doing something right now and you're not, and we're feeling it, we're going to keep calling and texting you, and we're going to keep poking at you until you finally confess to it. And it's not because we want to annoy you. It's because you need that, that how, how do you say, that pulling of the ear? We need that at times. We need someone to help us to be able to open up that door and to lead us to walk through that door because we don't know what, what the ex expectancy is of, from doing that. We don't know what to look out for. We don't know what to, what to, what's going to become. It's a, it's a, it can be a very uh, uh, a scary thing. Everything that's being done new in your lives is a step of faith. That means it's going to be nerve-wracking. You're going to experience nervousness. You're going to be scared at times. I remember when I'd done my first wedding in public and my first funeral in public. All my first everythings in public have always been something that have been, well, Lord, I don't know what to expect. 
and to me, the Lord's like, well, I expect the unexpected. <laughs> well, thank you, Lord. That's encouraging to me. <laughs> expect the unexpected. Why? Because he doesn't want us to try to, to predict what's going to happen. Right. He doesn't want us to know because we'll try to make it work towards that. He wants us to expect the unexpected because that means we're going in relying on him. And however way that it comes out, it's going to be him. We have no control over it. We have no control over life. A lot of things in life we have no control over. We, ha we love to have the idea of it. And normally we have the idea of it when things are going good. But when things are going bad, we know we're like, what? what's going on? Well, you never had control. Right. All you had was a time of peace. All you had was a time of, of being able to, to breathe again. We don't have control of life. Our decisions, yes, but our decisions doesn't affect others' decisions. Because if they change their, their minds, they change their ways, then what happens again? Life changes again. Things happen. Verse 9. It says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. And honor giving preference to one another, not nagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuously, steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints, giving to hospitality. Yes, that means over all the things that you are facing today, continue to give hospitality to the saints. Continue to take care of one another. Because in the time that you're doing good, and the time that we forget everything else, to the time when we're not doing so well, it hurts because sometimes it feels like we're alone. Love with the love that God has shown you. Not the love that you love, because your love suffocates. Your love suffocates. Your love is impatient. Your love is jealous. Your love gets angry. Your love is short-tempered. Your love, I mean, I, who wants me to keep going? This is our love. Our love is emotional. Put it that way. Our love is emotional. I'm not going to talk about football. We know how emotional our fans are out there. Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which are also in Christ Jesus. He made himself of no reputation. And this is where we learn humility. This is where we learn humility. When we come into a church setting, we're all people. We're all people with positions and people with ministry and leadership roles and this and that. But when we leave from church, you're just somebody. You're just a person that has responsibilities. You're somebody that God is working with. I'm just a pastor. I don't think myself any different. Most of the times I think myself very low, much lower than that. That's just the way that I grew. And sometimes I, you know, my wife, it's like, man, it's a, you know, sometimes you don't feel like who, who, you, who you are called to be. Like sometimes, you know what, you don't really feel like a pastor. It's not because you're doing anything wrong. It's because you don't really hold that title on, on a shelf. You become a people person. You talk to people normally. There's no, there's no, I would say there's no reward for that until the very end. It doesn't get you into places and VIP access. Right. You know, you don't get a golden ticket for anything that, that's cool. We're all trying to do one thing. We're all trying to serve God. We're all trying to survive. There's this thing going on, and I'm going to say it. 
I see this thing. We have a so, so solar eclipse coming up. And they're saying, oh, this is signs of this and that, and get ready because, you know, this what this means in Hebrew and this. Now, just stop it. Just stop it. The Bible says no one knows a time. No one knows when, when God is going to come back for us. Don't be doing the silly postings. I, I hope no one has done it here. I don't know. But no one knows when God is coming and we begin to make ourselves look like we don't know what we're talking about. And there's a lot of people that are relying on you. They're looking for that truth, that sound doctrine. This is what we should be speaking about. The doctrine that establishes us. The doctrine that saves us. If no one likes it, well then let them unfriend you. Then that means that they weren't even interested in that. I lost some friends because of the Bible. But I lost a lot of temptations in that too as well. I didn't know, it was, I didn't know that it was good for me then. They were friends for a long time. I mean, they're drug dealers and whatnot, but I mean, <laughs> they were still my friends, okay? But God took them out of my life because it was no good for me. And it hurt for, you know, because I knew them for a while. But then at the end, I got new friends. I got new friends. I got some crazier friends now than what I did even in the world. Out of all the gangsters out there, I got some crazier gangsters in the church than I do out there in the world. There are people that are more outspoken for God and their beliefs and the truths in the church than there are out there. And it's in you too as well. That's what God is looking for this morning. He's looking for that transformation. This morning, I just want to encourage you. Let God transform your life. Don't hold on to the little things. Don't hold on to anything. Hold on to Him. This is where we're going to be able to take in the fullness of what God has for us. Be encouraged this morning. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning, my God. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunities, Lord, that you have given us. My God, my God.